Testament, the book of Acts. The New Testament is divided into four parts. First, the life of Christ. Secondly, the book of Acts, which tells how to become a Christian. Third, the epistles, Romans through Jude, that tell us how to live the Christian life. And finally, Revelation, that tells us the hope of a Christian. In the book of Acts, we have three main teachings. First of all, the establishment of the church on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. Then the cases of conversion, how people became Christians from Acts 2 forward. But the main function of the book of Acts is the history book of the New Testament. It gives us a historical background for many of the books which follow. For instance, Galatians, that book has its setting in Acts 13 and 14. Philippians, Acts 16 is the divine commentary upon the book of Philippians. Acts 17, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, the gospel came to Thessalonica. And later, letters were written, epistles written to the church established there. First and Second Corinthians have their setting in Acts 18. Before you ever study First Corinthians, don't you ever begin to study in First Corinthians with chapter 1, verse 1. Begin it with Acts 18, where the gospel came to Corinth, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. And Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, and First Timothy set there, and Revelation chapter 2 has the background in Acts 19 and 20, both chapters. So remember that as you study this rich book. But it does tell how they took the Lord seriously. The book of Luke ends where the book of Acts begins. I personally believe that Luke had part in three New Testament books. The book of Luke and the book of Acts, we know that. And I believe he collaborated with Paul in the book of Hebrews. And that's why it's so deep. It has Paul's thinking and Luke's vocabulary. And he was the beloved physician, Colossians 4.14. And he wrote with such precision and with medical terms and richness. And after all, what did Paul say just before he died? Only Luke is with me, 2 Timothy 4.11. But at any rate, one of the greatest men who ever lived was Luke. He wrote the book of Luke. And the book of Luke ends where the book of Acts begins because the writer says, The former treatise, O Theophilus, in which I wrote unto you all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And Theophilus is mentioned in Luke also. And in this great book, we read of them taking the Lord seriously. He said, you begin in Jerusalem and you preach repentance and remission of sins in my name among all nations. You'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1.8. And they took the Lord seriously. And you can divide the book of Acts that way, incidentally. The first seven chapters in Jerusalem and all Judea. Acts 8.5, they went down to Samaria and preached Christ to them. And then Acts 13, beginning to the end of the book, to the uttermost part of the earth, the Roman Empire. And so well did they obey the Lord that all creation under heaven heard the gospel preached, Colossians 1, 23. All the inhabited earth had heard the gospel, Colossians 1, 6. Their sound went out in all the earth, Romans 10, 18. Mightily grew the word of God and prevailed, Acts 19, verse 20. The word of God grew and multiplied, Acts 12, 24. They so spake boldly that great multitudes believed, Acts 14, 1 to 3. And even a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Acts 6, verse 7. They turned the world upside down for Christ. Acts 17, 6. The marching orders of the New Testament church, the book of Acts, personifies the zeal, the love, the compassion, the loyalty, the dedication of those early saints. I read a commentary once by a very spiritually minded man. When he came to the end of Acts, he said, perhaps if we believe now what they believed then, we might accomplish now what they accomplished then. What a rebuke. Because we claim to believe what they believe. We just haven't done what they did. They had fewer men, less money, no modern means of communication or travel, and yet they did something we haven't even done to the Metroplex, to the whole inhabited, civilized, ancient world. They emblazoned the truth across the pages of history and the miles of the Roman Empire because they loved God. Every time I think of their success, I think of the little poem that says, He who lives to himself and dies to himself, to himself and none beside, lives as though Jesus never lived, as though he never died. Another poet said, I sought to hear the voice of God. I climbed the topmost steeple, but God declared, Go down again. I dwell among the people. God wants us to get the message to the whole wide world. And we used to be more evangelistically oriented than we are now. We're sort of like the old boy who prayed, bless me and my wife and Joe and his wife, that's four no more, amen. 
We don't seem to be too concerned about the five billion people on earth that are in desperate need of the gospel. And while brethren are spending $7.2 million for gymnasiums, the souls of men are dying all over the world without the gospel. Somebody will give account for that in the Day of Judgment. What a criminal imbalance of emphasis. How we could convince ourselves that that's more important than saving souls is something I'll never, ever know. Besides the fact there's no authority for using the Lord's money that way. And I'm not your enemy when I tell you the truth, and I'm not crazy. I'm just telling the truth. And when we return to the soul-saving business, and our hearts aflame for lost mankind, we'll appreciate that more. And if we don't raise up a generation of men and women in the body of Christ who have an insatiable, yearning, burning desire to spread the gospel, we're going to die. The church is not in the banking business, the money-saving business, the bodybuilding business. We're in the soul-saving business. And it's ever been so. And the book of Acts tells us that. The book of Romans has the pivotal verse in the whole Bible in it. Romans 1.16 is the key verse in the whole Bible. The gospel of Christ is God's power to save. The good news, the glad tidings, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's God's power to save. And Romans 2.16 says we'll be judged for that gospel. And Romans 3.24 says we're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ. And Romans 4.25 says He was delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification. And Romans 5, 8 says, God commend His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Romans 7, 24 and 25 says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. And Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 8.39. See the Christ-centered nature of the book of Romans? The book of 1 Corinthians is as up-to-date as the modern newspaper. If you read today's front page, entertainment page, scandal sheet, you'd see Corinth marching by again. Satan hadn't changed. The world hadn't changed. Sin hadn't changed. The truth hadn't changed. You know what the thesis of this book is problems in the church in Corinth. And every single problem they had save one we have today. And we have the principle of that one. The problem we don't have exactly is meets offered idols. But the practical application of our influence upon the weaker brother still exists. You know what their problems were? Exalting preachers instead of Christ. That's one of our big problems today. Another problem was human philosophy versus divine revelation. We've got some folk today that'd rather hear human philosophy preached than divine revelation taught. We really do. Well, people get tired of Bible preaching, but they never get tired of cute little philosophical notions. But they aren't going to be judged by the philosophy book. They're going to be judged by the Word of God. They better get used to it now. And when we accommodate their fancies, we're going to be lost too. Another problem they had in the church at Corinth was immorality, but they did something about their problem. They withdrew from that ungodly fellow. 1 Corinthians 5. Another problem was a lack of brotherly love by going before heathen courts to decide matters among brethren. And Paul chides them in 1 Corinthians 6. It says, don't you have a single wise brother in the whole church of Corinth? You have to go to the heathen? Are they the only ones that have enough sense to figure this out? In 1 Corinthians 7, the problem was one that's so great today, a lot of brethren don't want me to preach on it. You know what the problem was? Marriage, divorce, remarriage. And we think we settle that problem by ignoring it. And instead, we fill the church to overflowing with unscriptural marriages. First Corinthians chapter 9 talks of support for preachers. And it's all right for preachers who preach the gospel to be supported regularly, generously, and something they can count on, like wages soldiers in the Roman army receive each month knowing what it would be. It isn't wrong to support a preacher and support him well if he preaches the gospel. But if a man doesn't preach the gospel, he'll starve to death. The church has no authority to support a preacher that doesn't preach the gospel. It's only those who preach the gospel that should live with the gospel. Based on that, a lot of men ought to get very low wages. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Lord's Supper. An improper participation in it. It causes one to eat and drink damnation to his soul, not deserting the Lord's body. 
Another problem in the church at Corinth, miraculous gifts while they existed. How they were to be regulated, when they were to cease, and how they were not to be used as arrogant points. Another problem in the church at Corinth was a misunderstanding on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And 58 verses in the 15th chapter of that book address that fact. Another problem was the contribution. And it's such a problem today, some brethren pout when you preach on it and threaten never to give anymore if you don't hush. That's a real problem. The 1 Corinthians 16 says it's regular, first day of the week. And 2 Corinthians 9 says, as you purpose in your heart, and God loves a cheerful giver. All my life I heard brethren say you ought to give till it hurts. That's 100% wrong. We're to give till we laugh out loud. I didn't make that up. Paul said God loves an hilarious giver. The Greek word for cheerful is letter for letter, our word hilarious. So we're to give till we laugh out loud. And I don't see many people doing that. And then brethren say, may we return a small portion of what you've given us, and boy, we practice what we pray there. If there's any subject that's going to send people to hell in a hurry, it's stinginess with God. And a man robs himself when he robs God. The happiest Christians I've known through the years are the most generous ones I've known. With time, money, talent, energy. And they don't want uh, anything except the pleasure and joy of serving the Lord as their dividend. Second Corinthians, even though it has 13 chapters, is almost an unknown book. It has some of the real beauty spots of the Bible in it, though. They react to Paul's first letter, and he defends his true apostleship against the false teachers. That's the essence of the book. Let me share with you some of the verses. Let's get one verse per chapter part of the way anyway. Nearly every one of these verses you've heard, particularly at funerals. Beautiful verses. Next time you're asked to preach a funeral, and I remember the first time I was asked, I thought there was going to have two burials, me and him. Uh, but let me tell you something to do, and it'll help you, and you'll never forget it. Use Second Corinthians as your text. Just go through Second Corinthians, and you'll be comforted enough to maybe comfort them. Second Corinthians 1, 3 said, Blessed be the God of, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our affliction, that we may comfort others in their affliction. The perpetual nature of the comforting hand of God in our lives. 2 Corinthians 2.14, we're always led in triumph in Christ. And those of you who've been paying attention realize there's a method in my approach to Bible study. Learn one main verse out of each chapter of the Bible, and you'll know the overview of the whole book. And pretty soon you'll know something in every chapter of every book of the Bible. And pretty soon all your study will not be in vain, but will build in a practical way, your knowledge of the book. Some people study scattergun and don't remember a single thing except the last verse they forgot. We need to really try to get something out of every chapter. Second Corinthians 3, 5, our sufficiency is not of ourselves but of God. Please remember that. Second Corinthians 4, 13, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Based on that, a lot of brethren must not believe because they never speak up for Jesus. If you really believe, you'll have to speak. 2 Corinthians 4.13. 2 Corinthians 5.7, we walk by faith and not by sight. In Christianity, believing is seeing. We've got it backwards to the world. In Christianity, believing is seeing. We walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 6, what agreement hath Christ with Belial, the temple of God with idols, light with darkness? Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. We're to be distinctively the Lord's. The ecclesia of Christ. Not of this world. Called out of the world into a sacred relationship with God. We're to be uniquely different. But a lot of members of the church aren't different at all. They're just as worldly as their neighbors. And then wonder why we can't convert our neighbors. Second Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of this world worketh death. Second Corinthians 7, 10. 2 Corinthians 8.24, show the proof of your love. Notice the high level and high lofty pedestal giving is placed on. It's the proof of your love. So people who don't give generously and joyously must not love very deeply. They show a love for the world when they give stingily to the Lord's cause. 2 Corinthians 9.15, thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. 2 Corinthians 10.18, not he that commendeth himself is approved before God, but whom the Lord commendeth. There's the great verse to remember. And then the last verse, we will go to 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the last verse in the book. The beautiful benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Galatians and chapters is the most logical, straightforward book. Critics of the book call it, they say a legal mind is behind this book. Well, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, does tie things down in a nice little knot of logic. The purpose of this book is to prove the old law had fulfilled its purpose and that Judaism had been nailed to the cross. Galatians 2.21 is my favorite verse in talking to Sabbatarians. If righteousness cometh by the law, Christ died in vain. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness cometh by the law, Christ died in vain. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Galatians 3.24. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. And in Galatians 2.19, Paul said, I, through the law, am dead to the law. It was the very law he learned as a Jew that led him to Christ, that made him be dead to the law. And then he said beautifully, eloquently, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet there's not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live with the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. And the high water mark of Galatians is 6.14. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Ephesians, the deepest book in the Bible. That's right. I think Ephesians is deeper than Romans, Hebrews, or Revelation may be put together. And do you know why? It stresses God's eternal purpose. It goes back before time. God's eternal purpose. What is it, Paul? Christ and the church? In the infinite, eternal mind of God before the world began, He willed that one day the church be established. And that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known to principalities and powers in heavenly places. That does not mean. That verse does not mean. We're to let the world know about the church. It says, let heaven know the church is doing what it was established to accomplish. 1 Timothy 3.15 says, let the world know about it. Ephesians 3 says, let heaven know about it. What a challenge. And the most beautiful verse in the Bible on the church, Ephesians 3.21. Unto God be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Philippians, everybody's favorite. The theme, Rejoice in the Lord Always, Philippians 4.4. 4. Here was a congregation born out of adversity, begun in persecution, from the innermost prison, at midnight, in jail. Paul and Silas were singing praises unto God and praying, and the prisoners heard them. This church was begun in adversity and blossomed because of it. And Paul wrote to them later and said, You're my joy and my crown. You've had fellowship with me in the gospel from the first day until now. I thank God upon every remembrance of you. And every gospel preacher ought to have that relationship with at least one congregation. There's a church out in Odessa, Texas that I began preaching and working with in 1957. I've been back 20 times for gospel meetings and lectureships. Two of our four children were born in Odessa. Those brethren have helped me every way of preaching be helped. I guarantee you, if this afternoon when I walk out of here, I call one of the elders and said, I need $10,000 to spread the gospel, I'd get it. I've never asked them for anything, but I know they would. We've had fellowship in the gospel all these years. They love me and I love them, and that's the way it ought to be. And preachers who don't have that relationship don't know what they're missing. And churches that don't have that relationship don't know what they're missing, too. I feel sorry for brethren who can't wait to fire a preacher and a preacher can't wait to run off somewhere else and never establish any ties or any love and loyalty. That's a shame. Paul had fellowship with them in the gospel on the first day until now, and he thanked God for them. One thing I appreciate about the church of Philippi was the simple organization of the New Testament church. Elders and deacons and all the saints, period. They didn't have an associate minister for middle-aged women who work in suburbia to meet on the backside of the gymnasium in the sewing room. They just had elders and deacons and all the saints. That's it. That's plenty, and it's still plenty. God's way works. We get things so gummed up with super organization, we never get out of the committees. Oh, how we need to go back to just New Testament Christianity. We talk about the plan of salvation. How about the plan of organization? Elders and deacons and all the saints, period. Someone says, well, where's the preacher? He's one of the saints. I'm like the old country girl in East Texas said, I'm just a human being. That's what I am. Just call me Johnny. That's what my mother named me, and I kind of like that. 
I'm not a preacher that has to be called brother any more than I need to be called rabbi if you use it as a title. Elders and deacons and all the saints. How simple. How beautiful. Christians. And the whole theme is peace passing understanding because you put your trust in the Lord. Philippians 4, 7. If a man in prison could speak of contentment, Philippians 4, 11, and the Lord empowering him in everything to do that need to be done, Philippians 4, 13, and would state our God will supply all your needs, Philippians 4, 19, that doesn't leave anything to worry about, does it? You know, we can go down through life blissfully ignorant of all the problems. I guess I am a simple person, but I don't see all the problems a lot of brethren see in a preacher's life. I recommend to you heartily being a gospel preacher. Brethren have been great to me. The Lord's been even better. Nobody's enjoyed preaching the gospel any more than I have, and I don't have a big long list of uh, tales of woe to tell you about. I can tell you two times in 40 years I had a little misunderstanding with brethren, and one time was definitely my fault, and the other was about 50-50, probably leaning in my direction as being at fault. And so don't get caught up with preachers always mouthing about how badly they're treated. In the first place, you're not serving brethren, you're serving the Lord. And if nothing else could be said but that the Lord was gracious to let me serve Him 40 years, I could go to sleep tonight and thank God for that. That'd be worth it all right there. Don't forget for whom you work. And then rejoice in the kindness extended to you as gospel preachers. You'll be treated well if you think you will be. Don't move somewhere looking for the axe to fall. In fact, if you live in such a way that they know you don't care if they do fire you, they won't fire you. They won't pick on you, see. If you just let them know you're the Lord's servant anyway, and you're serving Him, and they can't fire you from serving God. You may have to serve Him somewhere else, but they can't fire you from God's service. They don't have the prerogative. They don't have the power. Very important, our attitude toward what we do. Attitude's about three-fourths of it, brethren. Just count on that. In fact, the three great words in Christianity, attitude, motive, and emphasis. You get those three right, everything else will be all right. Attitude, motive, and emphasis. And you're in control of that, incidentally. Nobody else can overwhelm you in that. Colossians. Draw a circle and put a dot in the middle. That's Colossians. The circle is your life and mine, and the dot right in the middle, that's Christ. He's the center of our life, the focal factor in all we do, say, or think. And Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 2.10 says, you're complete in Christ. Colossians 3.17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. See, we're surrounded by, bounded by, bounded by Christ. Don't lose that focus. First and Second Thessalonians can be studied together. Two books written to the same church, just a year and a half separated the two epistles in time. And they have three teachings in the two books. The second coming of Christ. He'll come as a thief in the night. No one knows when. First Thessalonians 5, 2. There'll be a departure from the truth and apostasy first. And Second Thessalonians 2, 7 in the first century said the mystery of lawlessness was already at work. When you hear international evangelists on TV say the Bible teaches that we're about to enter the end times and that apostasy is about to come, they're just 1,900 years late. Paul said the mystery of lawlessness was already at work in his day. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. And then in 2 Thessalonians, we read, and in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2 Thessalonians 3, we read of the third main point, the exhortation to godliness, so that whenever Jesus comes, and whoever apostatizes, you'll be ready. Did you know the greatest rules? Here's your good sermon, gentlemen. It's a natural outline. It's already in the Bible, and those are always the best outlines because there's no copyright on them. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we have rules for Christian living. Know those who are over you in the Lord and esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Despise not prophesying. Quench not the Spirit. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of heaven preserve your body, soul, and spirit unto the coming of the Lord. You won't find a better sermon context than 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 23. It's unbeatable. In fact, you can preach that for a week. Maybe use that for your first gospel meeting. Just wear them out on it. But anyway, in First and Second Timothy and Titus, you have three books written to evangelists who are as different as daylight and dark. 
I'm so thankful that we're not all alike. I'm glad we've got a Titus and a Timothy. And they're not both Titus, not both Timothy. Timothy was a shy young man. Paul had to write to him in 2 Timothy 1, 7 and say, God didn't give us a spirit of timidity. He'd been raised by two women. He didn't have a manly touch in his life, and he was shy. Paul had to be his father in the gospel and really train him to be courageous and bold. On the other hand, Titus was a blockbuster. Every time Paul needed someone to go to a hard place, he said, Come here, Titus. Go to the island of Crete, the most wicked place on earth, and set things in order and appoint elders in every church. When Paul sent Timothy to Corinth, he begged the Corinthians to treat him nice. And when he sent Titus to him, he told the Corinthians to watch out for Titus. Uh, they were different. And I'm so glad the Lord can use different personalities. I'm glad we're not all alike. He could use Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Luke and Trophimus. And, and we, we're very immature when we think everybody's got to be just like our favorite preacher. Pretty soon you wouldn't have a favorite preacher if everybody's just like them, see. Here are the five points in First and Second Timothy and Titus. Qualifications of elders. First Timothy 3, Titus 1. And elders are not elected by popular vote, but selected by divine mandate. And there's a lot of difference between the two. Qualifications of elders, preach the word, keep the church pure, live as an example. You know what the fifth dimension is? I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't. You don't hear much of it anymore. Rebuke false teachers. And you know how they rebuke false teachers then when they had to? They called them by name. They didn't say somebody somewhere did an evil deed. They said, Demas. Hymenaeus, Philetus, Alexander, Alexander the Great, or Alexander the Copper Smith, rather. He may have been great, I don't know. I'm getting tired. But anyway, those are the five main teachings of the book. Here they are. Qualifications of elders. Preach the Word. Keep the church pure. Live as an example. Rebuke false teachers. And here are your key verses in those three books. 1 Timothy 3.15. The church is the bulwark of truth. 2 Timothy 2.19. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2.19 Titus 2.12 And those who know Paul's writings in the original language and in the translations, who have studied every word he ever wrote, say that Titus 2.12 sums up all 13 or 14 of the epistles he wrote. We're to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. That's what Christian living is all about. And that's what these 21 epistles are all about. Living sober, righteously, God in this present world. Now the book of Philemon, one of the four one-chapter books in the New Testament. The story of a runaway slave named Onesimus. Philemon was an owner of slaves, and there were 60 million masters and 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. It was an economic way of life. Philemon had evidently been converted by Paul earlier. And he owned slaves, and one of them is Onesimus, who's not a Christian. He runs away from home. They live in Colossae. You learn that in Colossians chapter 4. You don't learn that in Philemon. He runs away from Philemon and Colossae and goes to Rome and finds Paul in prison and attends to his needs. The Roman Empire allowed that. But Paul attended to his greater need and converted him to Christ and sent him home as a beloved brother in the Lord with the epistle we know as Philemon. And Paul says to Philemon, If he owes you anything, put it to my account. Howbeit you owe me your own self also. Paul never got a bill, I'm sure. And in verse 6 of Philemon, he said, You communicate your faith to this babe in Christ in such a way as to strengthen him and not to weaken him. For perhaps, verse 15, he left thee for a season that he might return to thee forever as a brother beloved in the Lord. See the providence of God? Now we come to Hebrews. I wish we'd had enough time to cover that fully, but I did present that on the television program that this congregation uh, puts on each Sunday morning a few months ago. I gave a review of the entire book of Hebrews in 23 minutes. That's the hardest job I ever had to summarize Hebrews in that length of time. It's so rich. But it is the pivotal book in the Bible. If you know the book of Hebrews, you know the Old Testament. You know the whole Bible. If you don't know it, you don't know the Bible because the two go together. Hebrews was written to Hebrew Christians who were apostatizing from Christianity and going back to Judaism. It was a book written to tell them, Take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Hebrews 3.12 In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and 39, he continues, If any draw back, God will have no pleasure in him. For we're not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe unto the saving of the soul. 
Hebrews 3.12 and Hebrews 10.38 and 39. And in Hebrews 11.13, he said, These all died in faith, not having received the promise. God having provided some better thing for them with us, that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, the Old Testament worthies really had to wait until New Testament Christianity was substantiated before their blessings ensued. It's really a powerful point on the efficacy of the blood of Christ and the covenant that he documented in the shedding of his blood. In fact, the three main teachings of Hebrews, the first seven chapters, Christ is supreme. The main verse, please write it down in big letters, Hebrews 7.26. For such an high priest is becoming unto us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher in the heavens. Hebrews 7.26. The superseding excellency of Christianity, the better way. He's a better mediator, but better testament, established on better promises. Hebrews 8, 6, and 7. Chapters 8, 9, and 10, the old law had fulfilled its purpose. It was annulled, abrogated, taken out of the way. And Hebrews 8, 13 says, In that he saith the new covenant, he had made the first old. Now that which waxeth old and decayeth is ready to vanish away. And chapters 11, 12, and 13, the need for enduring faithfulness rather than apostatizing they need to accelerate the pace of godliness, that they might not miss heaven. And Hebrews 13, 20 eloquently sums it up. It refers to Christ as that great shepherd of the sheep, who through the blood of the everlasting testament draws us near to God. Hebrews 13, verse 20. And so the book of Hebrews exalts Christ to the uttermost, tells men the old law had been taken out of the way anyway, and then exhorts them to be even more faithful. Instead of apostatizing, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. The book of James, the most practical book on daily Christian living. The theme, James 4, 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it's sin. The need for positive Christianity. We must have it. James 1 speaks of pure religion. James 2 speaks of the correlation of faith and works. James 3 speaks of the proper use of our speech. And that doesn't mean just the things we're not to say. Proper use of our speech means we speak up for Jesus. We're not tongue-tied. We're not God's silent partners. I heard of a famous language teacher in a university who could be silent in 17 languages. What does that prove? Some of us are silent and the only one we know. We need to speak up. And James chapter 5 closes by saying, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he that converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. See how practical this book is? We need a double dose of it every day. First Peter, the need for patience and hope in the midst of persecution. You can understand the book by reading it out loud and underlining the words that appear over and over. There's always a key word in a book. Sixteen times in First Peter, in five short chapters, the word suffering is found. That's the theme. That's the background. If any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God in this name. 1 Peter 4, 16. That's what the book's all about. They were being intensely persecuted for being a Christian because they were a Christian. Imprisoned, put to death, vilified, mocked, scourged, spat upon, reviled. They suffered as Christians. But he said, don't be ashamed. Glorify God in this name. Second Peter, I believe it's the most cogent book ever given in all of literature. I mean by that, it has one theme. It pursues it all the way through. It begins with that theme and ends with that theme and never deviates from that theme. And the word knowledge is found 16 times in three short chapters in Second Peter. That's the key word. In Second Peter chapter 1, he mentions the ingredients of spiritual growth. Faith, knowledge, patience, godliness, brother, kindness, love, abound in these things. In the second chapter, he speaks of enemies of spiritual growth. False teachers, false doctrines. False attitudes. He said, while they promise you liberty, they themselves are the bond slaves of iniquity. And all these guys talk about freedom in Christ. They mean freedom to do what they want. The Bible says freedom in Christ is the loving willingness to do what he wants us to do. That's real freedom. Jesus said, if I make you free, you'll be free indeed. John 8, 36. Freedom in Christ never was licensed to sin. Galatians 5, 13 says, don't use your freedom as a cloak for sin. And then the third chapter of 2 Peter speaks of the motivation for spiritual growth. Christ is coming, and we know not when. 
And the last verse, the necessity of it. But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Savior Jesus Christ. I'm going to make a prediction. And I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, but I am a student of human nature. You young men who graduate in this school of preaching, by the end of the first year that you're out, will have decided which course you're going to take. You're going to be the laziest bunch of guys that ever walked, thinking you've already learned all you need, studied all you need, and you are so brilliant you don't need to open the book anymore, and you're going to die. Or you're going to realize you're just now getting started to know how to study. And you're going to realize that you know just enough to know how much it is you don't know. And then you'll grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. I've never seen it be one or the other. It's always one of those ways. May God help you to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and feed upon the inspired word that enrich your life and bless other people. Don't be Mr. Know-it-all. You've been peculiarly blessed to study intensified ways to learn the book. Now utilize that to really be good students of the Bible. The first six months I was out of college, I learned more about the Bible than I had the four years before in which I was supposed to be studying it. I learned how to study. First John, next to Ephesians, the hardest book to teach properly. And you know why? It has two themes that are the opposite of one another. The first theme is man's a sinner, First John 3, 4. And the other, God is love, First John 4, 8. And getting man the sinner back to God the lover is a hard thing to do. It's a struggle. One of the greatest things in First John is chapter 2, verse 1. Our Heavenly Father, whom many think is an austere judge, was kind enough to say, I'll appoint you a lawyer to plead your case. And he'll be my son, my only son, my only begotten son, my only begotten perfect son. And he'll be your lawyer to plead your case before my bar. Couldn't have a better lawyer than that, could we? Isn't that great? That when we do err, Christ pleads our case. The only perfect sinless one who ever lived. That alone ought to make me happy all day long, every day. I have the best lawyer that heaven could appoint. The only perfect one to ever live. In that he has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor those who are tempted. Hebrews 2.18. 2 John, a one chapter book, verse 9 through 11. Do not bid God speed the teachers of error. Don't go beyond the doctrine of Christ. If you do, you have not God. And you participate and cooperate with these false teachers that you're not even supposed to encourage. 3 John, verse 11, another one-chapter book. After giving the names and backgrounds to three brethren, Gaius, Demetrius, and Diotrephes, two of which were good, and one, Diotrephes, who was extremely wicked, he said, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but follow that which is good. Why is it that some weak members of the church only follow, follow weaker members of the church? Why do they never set their eyes on strong, solid citizens in the kingdom of God? Jude, another one-chapter book that I confess is one of my personal favorite 25 verses on earth. I don't know where you could ever find a more dynamic book in the truest sense of that word that's overused. They're scintillating. Those 25 verses will take your breath away. And in Jude, verse 3, this half-brother of the Lord who didn't even believe in Jesus until after his resurrection now writes a sterling book that will challenge you to your bootstraps. And in Jude 3, he said, Contend earnestly for the faith, once for all time delivered to saints. That's bold. That's aggressive. Jude verse 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Another thing I want to caution you young men about as you go out to preach, don't be childish and blame everybody else for your problems. Don't keep playing that childhood game saying, Look what the brethren made me do. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Jude verse 21. Look to yourselves lest you lose your own reward. 2 John 8. And then the most beautiful benediction that history records. Unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy the only wise God be glory and power dominion and majesty both now and forever. Amen. I believe he loved the Lord. Next time you get a little blue just read that out loud and it will make you love the Lord and make you ashamed of your own attitude. Well, we've covered everything but Revelation. 22 chapters that put the icing on the cake. God didn't drop something brand new on us to puzzle us at the end of the Bible. 
This is the icing on the cake. It's the wrap-up of every good story that's been told up to now. 200 Old Testament references in 22 chapters. If we don't know the Old Testament, we're the losers before we start. But if we do and look for these, we'll understand immediately the nature of this book. It's a book of principles. You know how long I'd argue about when it was written? Not one second. I don't care if you could prove it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem or in the last decade of the first century, which I happen to believe in the time of Domitian. I wouldn't argue that, though. It doesn't make any difference. It's a book of principles that apply at any time, to anybody, anywhere, forevermore. It's that kind of book. It's not a chronological narrative in order like Matthew and Acts. You know why we don't understand this book? We don't know the Old Testament. We don't know anything about the Roman Empire. We don't know anything about history. We're not curious enough to study it. We come to it with a predisposed attitude. We can't understand it because somebody in Timbuktu told us that when we were seven years old. We don't understand it because we don't even let the message of the book itself apply to the people to whom it was given in the first place. It was written to the seven congregations of Asia in the Roman Empire, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, concerning things that would shortly come to pass. That's in the first chapter. And it was signified unto them, that's in the first verse, in signs and symbols and imagery, illustrating principles of God's dealings with men. It's that kind of book. You know how I know it is? Because I've read the title, Revelation. And I've read in old Bibles, Apocalypse, which means the unveiling. It's a dramatic term. A curtain is about to be pulled on the stage of life. And in a panoramic sweeping view, God is showing John, who writes what he sees in these visions, down concerning things that would shortly come to pass. It was minutely fulfilled to the people whom received it in the first century. Of what value would it be to the saints in the first century to know that Alexander Campbell was coming along with the Restoration Movement of the United States of America in 1800. They said, Campbell, Scotland, America, 1800. What are you talking about? Restoration Movement? We're talking about the Roman Empire. We're talking about being in prison. We're talking being, about being shot at dawn because we're Christian. And you're telling us what will happen 1800 years from now? That doesn't make sense. Someone says, by countering, then you say it doesn't apply to us? I didn't say that. It applies to us. The principles apply to us and to anyone who ever lived. Was the book of 1 Corinthians addressed to the church of God at Corinth in the middle of the first century? What well, asked that to answer it. Does it apply to us? By way of application, it certainly does. But it applied directly to them concerning things they were faced with. It was immediate. Can I learn anything from the book of Revelation? I certainly can. And I'm about to tell you what I can learn. John, what you see right in the book, do you want to See what John saw? Then read the book of Revelation. He wrote down what he saw. So you can take his place and see what he saw. You can be John. By seeing what he saw because he wrote down what he saw. The curtain is pulled and he sees this drama before his eyes. Do you think he sat there a literal thousand years? So he could write in Revelation 20 about a thousand years? If he did, he'd be a pretty old man. His hand would be kind of shaky. I wouldn't want to trust his writing, would you? That's imagery. John, what you see right in the book, the very first thing you saw, Revelation 1.15, Jesus, who has feet as though they'd walked in a fiery furnace. That goes back to Daniel 3 in the Old Testament. The very Lord who walked with them in the fiery furnace walks with us in the fiery trials of our life as Christians. Does that comfort you? It certainly does me. In Revelation 1.18, he's introduced as one who was alive, then dead, and now is alive forevermore. You get the point? What if they were asked to die for Jesus? He had already died for them. But death wasn't the end of it. He, had, he rose to live forevermore, and so will they. It's a book of encouragement, a book of great joy. Revelation 2.10, he said, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. He didn't say be famous, wealthy, popular. He said be faithful. I'm glad that's what he told me to be. I can be faithful. Nobody can keep me from being faithful. They may kill me for being faithful, but I'll be faithful even as death comes and as death hovers over me. But it's Revelation 3.21 that gives us the key word in the book. And it's here we understand the thrust of Revelation. Seventeen times in these 22 chapters, the word overcometh is found. And that's the word in Revelation. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. So the Lord is saying, if you'll overcome Satan's self and sin, you can come over to live with me. 
And that's what Revelation is all about. Would that have comforted the beleaguered, persecuted saint who was about to die at the end of the first century? For Christ? It surely would. It comforted the 20th century. In Revelation 4, 1, what do you see, John? I see a door wide open in heaven. You mean we have access to heaven? All the doors in the Roman Empire are shut to us. I see a door wide open in heaven and God's upon His throne. Caesar doesn't reign in heaven. And the Lord invites us to come to Him in prayer for every time of need. And there's a rainbow over the throne. Here's that Old Testament. Genesis 9, God placed a rainbow in the sky after He had destroyed the world of unrighteousness with a flood, after He had rewarded the righteous, stating that He had judged the world again someday. That's what John saw. A righteous God has not abdicated. He's still on the throne of glory. And the Roman Caesars do not dwell there. Revelation 5. What do you see, John? I see a book in the hand of him upon the throne. It's sealed seven times. Seal means it's official. Seven times, very important. Running over on the backside, very full of the wrath of God. But nobody in heaven or earth is worthy or able to loose the seals and open the book and tell us what it means. Nobody but Jesus. And across the stage before John's eyes marches a lion, the strongest member of the tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. It's evident our Lord sprang out of Judah. And then all of a sudden the imagery abruptly changes and he's a lamb. From power and strength to innocence and purity and truth. That's Jesus. He's worthy and able to loose the seals. You know what that means? Only Jesus Christ gives proper meaning to world history. You take him out and it doesn't make sense. You put him in and everything falls in place. That's what that means. John, what do you see in chapter 6? I see martyrs, those who've been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, underneath the throne, crying out for deliverance. Remember that, because in chapter 20, he's going to see those beheaded saints again. And you know where they're going to be? Seated on thrones, reigning with Christ. And he's going to say, this is the first resurrection. That's the nature of this literature. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. You cannot defeat the eternal purpose of God. That's what that means. And that's what John saw. Chapter 7, what do you see? I see a great innumerable host on Mount Zion with the Lamb of God. Who are they? They've come out of great tribulation and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And they're partaking of the water of life that quenches their thirst forever. Revelation 7, 17. Chapter 8, what do you see, John? I see sweet-smelling incense in the halls of heaven. What is it? The prayers of the saints. Next time you think nobody listens to you anymore, heaven does. The next time you think you're worthless, heaven doesn't think that. Heaven is pleased with your prayers. They come up as sweet-smelling incense before God. First John 5, 14 says, This is the confidence we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. First John 5, 14. I'd rather heaven hear me than the whole neighborhood hear me, or the whole world, or the whole government. We need to get our priorities right. And then we won't be so displeased when we think we've been shuffled off to Buffalo. Heaven knows where we are, and heaven still cares what we say. Chapter 9, verse 20 and 21, what do you see? I see the wrath of God poured out upon impenitent men, who repented not of all their wickedness, though God poured out His wrath upon them to subdue them, and God poured out His love upon them to draw them, they repented not. And there are heartless people like that. In spite of all heaven does, they don't care. But in the day of judgment, God will be vindicated. He tried, and they wouldn't listen. Chapter 10, barred from Ezekiel chapter 2. This exact thing happens in Ezekiel 2. God told Ezekiel then and John now, in times of bondage, take this little book and eat it up. Thoroughly digest the Word of God. That's what it means. Jeremiah said, His words were found and I did eat them. And they were the rejoicing of my heart. Jeremiah 15, 16. It was sweet to his taste and bitter in his stomach. Sweet to be entrusted with the Word of God. But in realization of what it meant, that even some of God's people would be lost, it was a bitter pill to swallow. Chapter 11, verse 15 and 16. Some think the key to the whole book. One man who's been teaching and studying and writing on Revelation for half a century believes Revelation 11, 15 and 16, the key passage in the book. John, what do you see? I see that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. That's what it's all about. In the final wrap-up, earthly empires will rise and fall, kings will come and go, 
But Jesus Christ and him, His empire will never fall, never crumble. Revelation chapter 12. What do you see? I see that great enemy, the devil, that old serpent. He goes to the Garden of Eden. The devil, the deceiver of the whole world. Chapter 12, verse 9. Well, how can we possibly defeat him? Verse 11 of chapter 12. Through the blood of the Lamb, the Word of God, and by being willing to die for his cause. That's the unbeatable foe Satan can't handle. Those who trust in the blood of Christ know the Word of God and are willing to lay down their lives for the cause of Jesus. We just don't have many people like that. If we did, the devil would be constantly on the fast trot away. No wonder the demons believe and tremble. James 2.19 Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. I would that all my brethren in America would learn this verse. Those who live with the sword will perish with the sword. I know members of the church that believe our strength as Americans is military might. The Bible says those who live with the sword will perish with the sword. I thought the strength of this nation was moral purity, righteousness, integrity. But some of my brethren act like the worst thing in the world you could do is speak against military might. I follow the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace. And I have a weapon that's more powerful than all the bayonets and missiles and bombs put together, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Ephesians six seventeen. It's quick and powerful. Hebrews four twelve. What is meant by the mark of that man is six six six? Verse eighteen of chapter thirteen. You didn't think I'd get to that, did you? The number seven is a term of completeness, wholeness, perfection in Revelation. Seven angels, seven churches, seven candlesticks, seven spirits. The ancients in numerology counted seven, a perfect number. Anything short of seven would be imperfect, and six is short of seven, and six, six, six is way short of seven. In the context, he's simply saying anybody who bows down to emperor worship in order to buy and sell and get gain has the stamp of Rome's approval, but the mark of the beast upon him. He compromised truth. Any man that does that is far beneath perfection. But in my library are three books, and in some large libraries are probably a hundred, that show you that the ancients in numerology had a number for Christ, and his number was 888, far above human perfection. In this book of imagery, I have no doubt that's what that verse means. Imperfect, unwhole, unspiritual. Anybody who compromises truth, anytime, anywhere, for any cause. Chapter 14, verse 4. Here's the redeemed host on Mount Zion. How'd they get there? They followed the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. That's how to go to heaven. Follow Christ through suffering, persecution, the cross, death, agony. And you'll wind up where he is in heaven. He's now in heaven for us, Hebrews 9, 24. And in Revelation 14, 13, Jesus said to John, John write these words, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. In Revelation 15, 3, what do you see, John? I see the redeemed standing on the sea, singing the song of two stanzas, the song of Moses and the Lamb. The song of Moses, Exodus 14, 14. As they were about to cross the Red Sea by the power of God, they sang, Our God will fight for us. But Christians add a second stanza, and of the Lamb. And John said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. I can have victory in Christ because of what he did for me at Calvary. Song of Moses and the Lamb. That's what John saw. Chapter 16, what do you see? I see plagues. P-L-A-G-U-E-S. Plagues. Any Old Testament student remembers immediately Exodus 7 through 11. The plagues on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. What happened when the plagues were poured out upon evil men? What happened to God's people? They were untouched. See, that one word encouraged the early Christian who was being persecuted to realize he was soon to be delivered to a place where there'd be no plagues. And where only evil men like the Roman Empire contained would be plagued, would be punished. See, just one Old Testament word conjured in the mind of keen Bible students in a book that may have been written in coded language that the Roman soldiers couldn't intercept and understand, but which the Christians, school in the Old Testament, immediately comprehended. Chapter 17, verse 14. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and they are called and faithful and chosen. Isn't that a magnificent verse? Revelation 17, 14. King of kings and Lord of lords. Chapter 18, verse 5. The iniquity of the Roman Empire came up 
before God's presence in heaven. We can't hide sin from Him. Revelation 18.5. And in Revelation 18.17, in one hour, so great riches has come to naught. Why do we put such trust in materialistic things? This earth and the works therein shall be burned up. All these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons then ought we to be in all holy living and godliness? 2 Peter 3.11. That's what John saw. The vanity of earthly riches, of pomp and power as men counting. Chapter 19, verse 10. The spirit of the prophets is the testimony of Jesus. Did we not say today, the Old Testament said Christ is coming? The message of the prophets, Christ is coming. The spirit of the prophets is the testimony of Jesus. He's the only one that gives meaning to world history. Past, present, and future. In chapter 19, verse 15, he comes, the personified word, with the written word, the sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth, to slay in judgment the ungodly. And people will either be feasting in the marriage feast of the Lamb of God or be feasted upon by birds of prey, by vultures, like the Roman Empire. That's great imagery, but it illustrates the point. You stand with the Lord, you'll be blessed. You turn your back upon Him, vultures, spiritual vultures will consume you. I know that's extreme hyperbole, but it illustrates a principle. You do not win by serving Satan. You cannot lose by serving Christ. Even if they kill you for it, you're a winner. Chapter 20. What do you see? I see Satan bound. And then lose for a little season. What does that mean? He was bound by the death of Christ. In John 12, 31, Jesus said, Now is the prince of this world cast out. This he spake concerning his death. John 12, 31 and 33. But that didn't mean Satan had no power at all. For the H. Leo Bowles originated the concept of the devil as a mad dog chained. And he said, a mad dog chain can't bother you unless you're dumb enough to walk into the periphery of his chain, open the gate and walk in where he is. He'll gobble you up and probably should if you're that dumb. The point is that the devil cannot get us, cannot get us, unless we let him get us. If we're so worldly, we wander into the periphery of his chain where he has power. We're liable to never escape. But if we abstain from all appearance of evil and cleave to Jesus and abhor that which is evil, Romans 12, 9, he can't get us. He has power, but it's limited. And we only give him access to us when we walk into where he operates. That's why we preach against dancing, drinking, smoking, gambling, immodesty, and so forth, and will until we die. We want to keep people away from the mad dog. Chapter 21, what do you see, John? Well, I see that Satan was bound, and his friends, the beast of the sea and the beast of the land, are gone. So that only leaves things coming from heaven. That only leaves good, godly, spiritual things. In the last two chapters of Revelation, the conquest of Christianity, victory in Christ, triumph of truth, the end of a beautiful story. Chapter 21, what do you see? I see how people get to heaven through 12 gates of pearls. 12 gates, an abundant entrance, made out of pearls. You know how pearls are made? By friction, tribulation, opposition. The greater the tribulation, the more precious the pearls. How do we go to heaven? It's an abundant entrance, 2 Peter 1.11, but we get there through suffering, through tribulation. Paul said, I reckon the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that should be revealed. Romans 8, 18. And in the world to come, Jesus said, you'll have eternal life. Mark 10, 30. Chapter 22, the last stand of the whole Bible. What do you see, John? I see the garden of God and the tree of life in the midst of it. Why, we haven't seen that since Genesis 3. In the garden of Eden, when men were purged from the garden, the tree of life, because of sin. But what we lost in Adam, we gained in Christ. How do we get there? Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Revelation 22:14. Therefore, what we lost in Adam, we gain in Christ. Paradise lost is paradise regained, and John Milton didn't originate that thought. He may have embellished it, but that's been in Revelation 22 all the time. So the full circle of the Bible comes back to where it started. The Bible will be summed up in three trees. The tree of life in the Garden of Eden, the tree of the cross where Jesus died, and the tree of life in the garden of God in Revelation 22. And when the Bible comes to a close, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. And the saints say, Even so come, Lord Jesus. And the curtain falls on the story of the Bible. Christ is coming. He did come. He's coming again. And when He does, Paul said, We'll meet Him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The glorious, marvelous, pulsating, thrilling story of the Bible from cover to cover.